So welcome to this webinar on research identity, managing and raising the visibility of your scholarly profile. This is a part of the um, UNCG University Libraries Research and Applications webinar series. So in this series, different librarians cover topics on UNCG libraries, resources and research tools. They are 30 minutes and recorded in Zoom where we are now and placed on the library webpage through YouTube, where they will eventually be closed captions and not have participant data available for the public. So if you want to learn more about this webinar series and see other things we have coming up, uh, here is the link to our webinar page. So throughout this webinar, uh, please keep yourself muted. You were set to mute it on entry and ask your questions in the chat. Again, if you are in full screen mode, you can push escape and then see your chat icon down at the bottom and you should be able to see it. I will monitor the chats for Anna while she presents and uh, let her know if there's anything pressing. Uh, at the end, if we have time, we will, uh, you are welcome to unmute yourself to ask your questions or continue to use the chat. If you have any technical issues throughout this webinar, you are welcome to email me, but please remember that this is being recorded. So worst case scenario, you will get the recording after this as well. So if there's any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Uh, hopefully, I assume the sounds okay because y'all said that at the beginning. But uh, right now, I'm going to introduce our host. So this session that you see in front of you is going to be hosted by uh, UNCG Libraries Anna Kraft, our coordinator for metadata services. And Anna, you can take it away. All right, great. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for setting this up. And thank you to the participants for being here. Um, if you have questions throughout the, the presentation or afterward, I am glad to take them. So we're talking about research identity, managing and raising the visibility of your scholarship. And so these are some of the questions that you might be asking yourself when you're thinking about this topic. So if you're thinking, how can you make your research stand out? And how can you make sure that people can find your research? And then also, how can you make sure that your research is attributed to you and not someone maybe with a similar name? So research identity can help with all of these questions. And this is what we're going to go over today. We're going to understand what research identity is and why managing it is important. We'll look at some systems that can help you do this. And hopefully we'll find one or more that might be appropriate for you. So first, what is research or researcher identity? So this can be made up of a lot of different things. It includes your institutional and organizational affiliations. So if you're affiliated with UNCG, which I assume everyone in here is, then that's part of your research identity. Citations of your research and your publications are part of it. Um, your profiles that you might have online that show your publications and other research activities, your research collaborations, anything that you do around peer review and editorial activities for journals or other organizations, and even the way that your name appears on your publications and presentations is a piece of this. Do you need to manage your research identity? So, if you are going to be publishing and you want to track your citations, this is going to be important. If you want to apply for grant funding, especially for federal grants, this might be helpful to you. If you want to make sure that your scholarship is attributed to you and not someone who has a similar name in academic search systems, even if you change your institutional affiliation, this can be helpful. And it can also make your research more visible to other scholars, readers, potential collaborators, funders, and others. And then if you're on the tenure track, this can really help you in terms of tracking citations and making sure that your research impact is shown. So what do researcher profiles and systems and services offer? It can vary according to system, but often they include information about your publications. This might include citations of those publications, links to them, and in some cases, it may include the full text versions of those publications. Some systems include citation tracking and they might show usage metrics of your works. 
Some systems offer unique identifiers that can help distinguish you from other researchers. And some might include information about your research interests. So these are the systems and the services that we will go through pretty briefly today. Uh, we sometimes do a longer session where we actually sit down with people and set up profiles with them if they need assistance with that. But we're not going to do that today. We're just going to do really an overview. So a question for y'all who are here. Do any of you have a profile in one or more of these systems? NC Docs, ORCID, Google Scholar Citations, Scopus Author ID, The Loop, from the Open Science Research Network, Mendeley, um, Web of Science Researcher ID. Great, yes, awesome. Okay, so it sounds like we've got somebody who's got at least one of these and somebody who doesn't. So uh, we've got a good mix here. And I know that both Sam and I have profiles in some of these systems. So um, yeah, all right onward. So the first one we're going to talk about is NC Docs. And this one is a UNCG product. It is an institutional repository that shares open access scholarship from UNCG faculty and students. And lots of universities have a repository like this. They are often branded according to the university. They might have um, a name that has something to do with maybe the uh, campus mascot or something like that. Um, NC Docs for us is the North Carolina Digital Online Collection of Knowledge and Scholarship, which is a mouthful. So we just call it NC Docs. And it provides a stable long term platform and profile that can share your scholarship. It shows usage through download counts of your uh, works that are posted there, and it can fulfill public access requirements from some granting and funding agencies that require public open access to publicly funded research uh, results like publications and things like that. So this is an example of a profile in NC Docs. This is one of our professors from Human Development and Family Studies. And so we see her name, a little information about her, a, a brief research bio. And then if we scrolled down at the bottom, we would see a list of 84 publications. And if we clicked through to each of those publications, we would find the full text version of that work. So this as an open access database is really meant to share full text scholarship. Not all scholarship can be added to NC Docs because uh, we were not able to get copyright clearance for everything. But when we are able to get copyright clearance from publishers, then we're able to post those full text versions. Um, so for NC Docs, the works need to be the intellectual property of a faculty member, student, or staff member from UNCG. It's fine if they're co-authored with somebody who's outside UNCG, but at least one person at UNCG needs to be involved in the creation of it. The work should be complete and in final form as much as possible. We don't do like drafts or versioning. Um, and then they need to be scholarly research or educational materials. What can go in NC Docs? Most of the things that are in there are text-based, uh, articles from journals, from conference proceedings, case studies, working papers, things like that. But we can also take other types of scholarship. Uh, PowerPoint presentations and other visual files. Some people do like to add slides from conferences. We can also add multimedia, including audio, video, and other formats. One of the things that is sometimes a sticking point for those multimedia files is copyright. If it includes um, perhaps audio, music that is copyrighted to someone else, then it is unlikely that we would be able to add it. Um, but you can always ask, and we can look into it. So why would you use this system? It allows you to easily share full text versions of your scholarship, which can really increase your readership. And there are studies out there that show that open access scholarship, scholarship that's available online to anyone without a paywall, um, gets read and cited more than scholarship that is behind, hidden behind a paywall. Uh, NC Docs will allow you to maintain an openly accessible scholarly profile, and it's a way to support open access. How do you get a profile? You can contact us at ncdocs at uncg.edu. 
You can send us copies of documents that you want to see, uh, want us to check on if we can post them, or you can send a CV or a list of your publications, and we take care of the rest. So as I said before, we're not able to add everything in all cases, and some publishers do require embargoes of maybe a year or something like that before content can be added, but we, we check on all, the, all of that copyright information with the publishers. So our next system is ORCID. This is the Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. It is a persistent digital author identifier. It's a number that gets assigned to you and it provides authoritative identification of your works with you as a researcher. So it can help distinguish you from other researchers. And it can help support automatic linking of your works across institutions, publishers, and funders. And it's integrated with a lot of research systems, including Archive, Crossref, PubMed, Scopus, and others. So it works with a lot of systems out there that researchers use, and their goal is that they want you to be able to enter data once and reuse that data often. So it's very easy to sign up and anyone can sign up. You register, get a unique identifier, add whatever information you want to add, and then you start using that identifier uh, when you submit publications and apply for grants and things like that. So this is an example of uh, part of a profile from a UNCG faculty member who has an ORCID ID. And you see his name at the top left, Nicholas Oberlies, and his ORCID ID is in that box right below his name. So those um, 16 numbers are his identifier. And then we see a little bit of information about him on the right. We could drop down to see employment and education. And then there's a long list 197 works that he has published or that are uh, otherwise assigned to his identifier. And you can see DOIs on these. These will not necessarily take you to an open full text version. You might hit a paywall. So this is really just about linking the works, but it does not, it's not a database that uh, provides access like NC Docs. Uh, you can also add information about yourself like your website and connect yourself through other identifiers. You can see that on the left. Ways that you might see examples of an ORCID ID used. Um, so this is a journal in librarianship called Serials Review. And as an author or peer reviewer, you can log in with a username or password, or you can log in using your ORCID ID. And a lot of journals have something like this set up. Why would you use ORCID? So this can help you disambiguate your name and research from others who have similar names and similar research. It can help you authoritatively identify yourself and your scholarly output to publishers, funders, and others. And some funders and publishers are actually requiring the use of ORCID IDs with submission of grants or publications. Um, ORCID, your profile, you can set it to be automatically updated when manuscripts are published or grants are awarded. So that data will uh, be added to your profile because it's linked to your ORCID ID. And some publications can be that are linked to ORCIDs can actually be directed automatically from one repository to another behind the scenes if there are requirements. I think maybe PubMed does this uh, requirements for depositing in certain open databases or other uh, types of databases. So this is a, a system that's really integrated with a lot of different systems out there. How do you get an ORCID? You can register online. It's very easy. Anyone can sign up and there are links here with more information. Our next uh, service is Google Scholar Citations. So this, you've probably used Google Scholar to search for articles and things like that. Their Google Scholar Citations product will create a profile for you that groups together all of your publications that are indexed by Google. So not necessarily everything, but everything that Google has, um, has indexed. It tracks citations and graphs them over time, and it can compute several citation metrics. So it can be interesting if, uh, to keep an eye on this if you're going up for tenure and want to show impact of your work. 
So if you go to Google Scholar, you see the little My Profile up in the left, and that's what you want to go to. And here's an example of a UNCG researcher who has a Google Scholar citations profile. This is Paul Sylvia from Psychology. And so we see some basic information about him, that he is part of UNCG, uh, his research interests. And then we would see a long list of his publications, including titles, how many times they've been cited, and when they were published. And like ORCID, this is not something where you necessarily are going to be able to access the full text. You might hit a paywall if you try to access these materials. Um, so it's not an open access database, but it shows you information about his citations. And then on the right, you have information about some of those metrics. So you can see the number of citations that he's gotten, his H index score, his I-10 index score. These are extremely high. Paul is a, a very prolific researcher and he, his work has tremendous impact. So somebody who's just starting out in the profession would not expect to have numbers anywhere close to this. Um, he's kind of a superstar in terms of showing examples. But we can see also a, a graph of his publications and citations. And then if we scroll down further, we would see co-authors who have worked with him. Why would you set up a profile in the system? If you wanna track your citations and access some metrics for free, this is a great system to use. You can also maintain an easily editable scholarly profile that can go with you no matter what institution you're at. So how do you get a profile? You can register online. It's recommended that you use your personal Gmail, not your institutional email. You can use your institutional email. It will let you set up a profile that way. Um, what can happen though is that if you lose access to your institutional email, like by leaving UNCG, you might lose access to um, your profile. So, and it is possible to migrate content later if you sign up with an institutional account and lose access to it, but it can be somewhat time consuming. So just think about that when you were thinking about signing up for uh, one of these. Our next system is Scopus Author ID. So this is an identifier that is automatically assigned by Scopus and it creates a profile which is managed by Scopus that shows citation counts and some visualizations of uh, research productivity and other metrics. This is only available to authors who have papers that have been published in journals indexed by Scopus. So here's Paul again as an example for us. This is a snapshot of his uh, Scopus author ID profile. And we can see some of the same information that we've seen in other systems. We see his name, that he's associated with UNCG. We see some subject areas. And then we see how many documents by him, how many citations, what his H index is. You'll notice that these numbers are different than what we saw on the Google, uh, Google Scholar citations profile for him. That's because this is a different universe of content. It may include some of the same publications as Google, but it uh, doesn't have quite as much. Scopus is a more limited content set than Google Scholar, so the numbers are different. Um, and this is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about choosing a profile or profiles to use because they will reflect your research potentially differently, and some of them may actually make you look better than others. So if we scrolled down, we would see his publications and there's an option to find full text. So Scopus is an Elsevier product and it is definitely not an open access database and you are very likely to run into paywalls with this. So you can see the citations, but you are not guaranteed to be able to access the content. Why would you use this? Again, if you want to track citations and access metrics and some visualizations of your scholarship, this can be helpful. And these profiles are actually created for people whether they want them or not. So as Scopus is indexing content, it is creating these profiles automatically. So if you have published in a journal that Scopus indexes, you may want to see if you have a profile that's been created and then check to make sure that it's correct. How can you find and edit your Scopus author ID if you have one? So here's a link. 
and it'll take you to a search page. You can search using your name and your institutional affiliation, or if you have an ORCID ID, you can search that way. You want to look at your profile for correctness, and there are some options to submit changes to Scopus. You can't go in and edit, edit it yourself, but you can submit changes to them. All right, moving right along, our next one is Web of Science Researcher ID. And this is available for anyone. Um, Web of Science is a product that is pretty expensive that UNCG does not have access to, but any individual, regardless of whether their institution is affiliated, can actually sign up for one of these identifiers. So this tracks publications, citations, and peer review and editorial activities, and it calculates your H index score and also can provide some alt metric data. And it links to ORCID and also to some social media accounts. So this is an example of a profile. We've gone back to Nicholas Oberle's this time, and we can see information about his number of publications and citations, index, uh, the, the H index, and there's also information about his peer review activities. So unlike the other systems, this one is built to also give you credit for your peer review uh, and editorial activities. It will not like show your peer reviews that you have written or anything like that. The, that information is uh, generally confidential. Uh, between you and the journal, but it does track that you have done them and that it's uh, being tracked through the system. And this is not something that's automatic. This is something that you would sign up for. And you can see his researcher ID number in the top right. Uh, in, toward the bottom, you see research fields, and he's connected this to his ORCID ID. So an example um, of an alt metric score associated with this uh, with researcher ID. This is something that you will only be able to see altmetric data on yourself. So I've got an article uh, that I did within a, the last couple of years with a couple of colleagues. Um, I'm not able to show you somebody who has a, a much larger altmetric score um, because I can't see altmetric data on other people, which I think is good. Um, so if you sign up for a researcher ID, and your uh, publications are getting mentioned on the web, on Twitter, on other systems, if you've got readers on Mendeley, um, this will help you visualize uh, how and where those, um, those shares are happening. But it's not something that the publisher, that the public will be able to see. So why would you use this system? Again, it lets you track citations it lets you access metrics, including alt metrics. This is the only resource that we've talked about today that will show alt metric data. And it also lets you track and visualize peer review and editorial activities. So if you're very active in that kind of professional service, this can be a good system to use to help you show um, that work and get credit for it. How do you register? Here's a Go link that will take you to a registration page for Researcher ID. And now a couple of questions for us. So do you need more than one Researcher ID or profile? And how do you choose which systems to use? So if you're making a choice about which systems you want to use, you want to think about which ones index work in your field. And then if your funders or your publishers require the use of certain systems, like potentially ORCID, you're going to want to use that. If your colleagues and collaborators are using certain systems, those might be also useful for you. If you're a graduate student, your advisor might have recommendations. And then thinking about which metrics make you look good. If you're on the tenure track and you want to be able to compare and show different metrics from the different systems, you may want more than one of these. Here's a quick comparison of these systems. Almost all of them offer a persistent ID number. Google Scholar does not. It's really kind of profiling you based on your name and your research and what institution you're at. It's pretty good. Sometimes there are errors. Um, all of them offer some level of user profile. All of them offer a publication list. And CDOCS is the only one on the list that will show um, full text open access scholarship. 
Um, all of them offer some kind of citation metrics except for ORCID, which is really, that's not what they're about. Um, NC Docs for user privacy controls, we're not going to add anything about you to NC Docs without your request. So that's the privacy control with that. With the others, with ORCID and Google Scholar and Researcher ID, you have options to be able to limit uh, who can see your profile and whether it's public. With Scopus, you don't have that option since it is created and managed by Scopus. Um, ORCID integrates with a lot of different systems that are out there. Uh, Google Scholar does not. NC Docs also just works at UNCG. Um, although it's visible, the content is visible and available to people everywhere. And then Scopus and Researcher ID or integrate with ORCID. And at the bottom, I've got a note about whether they're nonprofit or commercial services. So NC Docs, in its association with UNCG, is a nonprofit uh, database. ORCID is a nonprofit organization. All the others on here, Google Scholar, Scopus from Elsevier, Researcher ID from Web of Science, these are commercial products. So that might also inform your decision. Other considerations. If you're interested in supporting open access and you want to share full text open access versions of your work, NC Docs is a great option. If you're going to be publishing in online scholarly journal, journals and pursuing public grant funding, you probably are going to need an ORCID ID. If you want to track citations and metrics, then Google Scholar Citations, Web of Science Researcher ID, and Scopus Author ID may all be useful for you. So now we are finishing up and I, uh, another question for y'all. Now that you've heard about all of these systems, do you think you want a profile in one or more of these systems? And also, if you've got any questions, uh, I would be glad to take them. Okay, so um, y'all are welcome to use the chat again. Um, so yeah, um, someone asked, where does ResearchGate fall within all of these? Great question. So ResearchGate is a commercial product that uh, researchers can uh, elect to use. It does include a lot of scholarship. It does not include um, like when I was talking about NC Docs, I talked about how we check copyright and things like that. There's not that copyright oversight with ResearchGate, which can um, result in people getting takedown notices for putting their scholarship there. It's not something that I'm going to tell people that they can't use. You certainly can elect to use that if you want to. Um, it is a commercial product, and while they may not be charging you, they do sell services, both them and uh, another competitor called academia.edu. Um, they are selling people's data. They're trying to sell things like job postings. So it, it certainly can be a way to make, have a profile that you have control over and make your scholarship visible. Um, I don't put it say, quite in the same category as the systems here. Um, but it, I think it can be useful in certain situations. I hope that helps. Okay, great. And um, Anna, do you have a link to this as well? I know there's all these go links. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 a like, link to the slides. Yeah, because then they could just have. Yes. Uh, yeah, I will share with Sam a link that can be sent out uh, to show the slides with y'all. And then here's the link recap at the end that shows um, what we've talked about today. Is it possible to link an ORCID that was made at a previous institution uh, with an email account that I no longer have access to to my personal ORCID that I now use? That is a great question. And I would think you are not the only one who is in that situation. Um, some institutions are doing uh, blanket ORCID IDs for everybody, but that gets confusing then when somebody leaves the institution. Um, I hope that it is possible to do that, but I actually can't say for sure. I've never been in that situation. I think that that's something that I would contact ORCID about 
to see if it's possible to link those um, or to migrate data between them because you definitely want to be able to get uh, to have a profile that shows full credit for what you uh, for all your work that you've been doing. I might have to look into that a little bit more. Uh, UNCG does not have an institutional affiliation with ORCID, so we don't create accounts for everybody, but I know a lot of institutions are doing that. So I went question. into my um, ORCID ID just now, and like I have a personal account, not an institutional one. And when I log in and scroll down, it lists my personal email and my institutional email. And there's a little like edit button that you could add another one. So like hmm. just add one and then you could delete. It says here I could delete one too. Would that work? It's possible. So if you've got more than one ORCID ID, then it may be a little bit like more than one number assigned to you. I bet that they deal with this pretty regularly. So it, what Sam is describing, it's pot, maybe it, that would be worth looking into. And if it doesn't seem possible through that interface, then I would email ORCID and, and ask. Uh, yeah, they have a this. help button and I, I think they're responsive. Yeah. Um, like if you scroll down, like it's a big, big help button and like you could, I think, chat them or email them. Awesome. Okay, great questions. So as someone just asked, um, the benefit of NC Docs if I expect to leave UNCG at some point? Another great question. So if you don't think you're going to be at UNCG in the long term, it is fine to not set up an NC Docs or to request to have one. So we don't automatically delete content when people leave. Um, so we, your content would stay live in the system unless you asked us to take it down. So you would continue to be able to see um, the number of downloads and uses of your works. So if you wanted to go ahead and set up a profile while you're here to have, uh, to make your content available uh, for others to read and for, so that you could see um, the number of uses that that content is getting, then you're certainly um, welcome to, to contact us and we would be glad to set up a profile for you. Um, but if you think that you're not gonna be at, at UNCG very long, then you might wanna wait till uh, you're at your next institution, which probably has a similar product. And I think that's a good question also to ask like in your um, interview, if you're um, a grad student or looking for other jobs too, um, about what institutional repositories they have. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, Sam. Um, they may have an institutional repository. They may have institutional accounts with systems like ORCID. So it's, these are, are things to think about when you're looking at other institutions that you might go to. Great. Great. Yeah. These well, are really thank you guys questions. for your questions. We've done this before. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, as uh, people, before you all leave, um, just to let you know, um, there is a panel tomorrow on experienced online professors with um, professors who've been teaching online at UNCG for years. It's tomorrow at 1030 a.m. Um, even if you're grad students, if, it, if you are interested in becoming professors and teaching online, obviously, I think with what's going on right now, that's uh, possibly something that's even going to grow more than it has already been growing is teaching online. You're welcome to sign up for that there. Um, so it's tomorrow at 1030 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. I don't want to assume that you're uh, all on the East Coast, I guess. And um, here is a quick uh, assessment on how this went. If you all have time to fill it up, uh, fill it out. And I'll also send it out in the uh, form. And uh, let us know if you have questions. And you'll get the uh, link to the recording of this when we have it, which usually is in um, a day or two. Is there any other final comments, Anna, or questions from the audience? Just want to thank y'all for being here and if you have questions after the fact you're welcome to get in touch um, we when sam sends out the recording we'll make sure we also share the slides uh, so that you'll have all this information okay great well everyone have a great day
and uh, I will see you soon. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Bye. Bye.